Paleontologists predicted an ant fossil that had features of wasps in the Cretaceous, and that was confirmed as Sphecomirma. For one thing, this species was never found to ever have any wings. No Sphica yerma hamuli was ever found around the anterior portions. As were wasps, their fore and hind leg wings are hooked together with groups with tiny little hooks called hamuli, which ants do not have. Also consider, according to evolutionists, it was believed that this evolutionary age of 79 to 92 million years ago, there had not yet been any complex social organizations of ants into colonies. However, with careful analysis of these specimens, it reveals the presence of the metapleural gland, which is only found in ants and only those that live in colonies. These glands secrete antibiotics which prevent bacteria and fungi entering the colonies. Ants were always ants. They never transitioned into flying, nor became wasps. Not a single drop of observational or testable science proves that ants became wasps. Orphan genes. The working assumption had been that, given common descent, and the fact that most housekeeping genes are shared among living things is highly conserved, including the prior assumption that evolution occurs by extremely small changes. Orphan genes should be rare, if not non-existent. However, as scientists sequenced more genes from different organisms, they are discovering that roughly 10-40% to 40 of each genome's protein coding sequence is new. That is, unlike any other known protein coding sequence. These are orphan genes, and this was one of the biggest surprises to come out of the whole genome sequencing project. Before I can get into it, remember this quote by noble Laurel Francis Jacob. He explained the accepted view of how evolution constructed new genes. He said, Once life has started in the form of some primitive self-replicating organism, further evolution had to produce through alterations of already existing compounds. As you can see, new genes must arise from pre-existing genes, leaving the signal of ancestry in their closely related sequences. In 1924, the Doheny Scientific Expedition ventured into the Havasu Canyon region of the Grand Canyon. The expedition report, penned by Samuel Hubbard, is a short but fascinating read. Now this short expedition brought multiple enigmas to the attention of the scientific community. One discovery of fossil footprints was only briefly mentioned in the report, saying that Mr. Gilmore was at a loss to explain these carboniferous footprints. That Mr. Gilmore was Charles W. Gilmore, who gave more detail in the Smithsonian Miscellaneous Collections. Mr. Gilmore showed the footprints which bore a clear resemblance of horse footprints to the local Native Americans to see what they would say about them. The local Native Indians considered them to be the tracks of a band of wild horses. Now I want you to remember Indians were natural trackers, and they could well identify any animal by its footprints, as their hunt depended on it. I would think they know what a horse footprint looked like, especially considering the fact that they owned and rode horses daily at this point. But the problem for evolutionism was that these footprints were out of place. They were in Permian rocks. The rocks were far too old, according to evolutionary theory. After all, many people still believe in the evolution of the horse. Although the sequence has been proven wrong years ago, it still appears in textbooks today, so I'm sure many listening still believe in this lie. But regardless, if you actually look at the charts, the first supposed ancestor of the horse supposedly had arisen 50 million years ago. But now, these fossil footprints in the Grand Canyon identical to those of modern-day horses, were in rocks that had been dated by evolutionists pushing 300 million years. <laughs> Not only does this totally debunk horse evolution, but it puts modern horse way down at the bottom of the geologic time scale. Mr. Gilmore did the only thing he could have done, which was attempt to explain away the footprints as not even fossil footprints. A desperate rescue device. He tried to say that they were just stains in the rock. But decades later, the famous E.D. McKee visited the footprints and called them footprints. <laughs> he said it's ridiculous to not call them footprints, but he labeled them as an unidentified vertebrate animal. 
or just an animal with four legs. Native Americans specifically told them, these are horse tracks and they belong to that animal. The answer was so glaringly obvious, but you see, evolutionary theory does not permit the glaringly obvious conclusion. Evolutionary theory is not science. It is anti-science, ruling out possibilities and discoveries before they are even made, and anything that is contradictory to it. These horse fossil footprints rule out the anti-science theology, which is evolutionism. So in closing, horses supposedly evolved around 50 to 60 million years ago, yet we find horse tracks deeper than we do dinosaur tracks in the geologic column in the Grand Canyon. But it gets better. The Doheny expedition also documented the fascinating petroglyph of what they even labeled as a dinosaur. Hubbard commented that the photograph of the dinosaur, petroglyph, had been shown to a scientist of report, who then remarked, It is not a dinosaur. It is impossible because we know that dinosaurs were extinct 12 million years before man appeared on the earth. <laughs> Gotta love how they know it's a fact, even though the very date that they quote in this is so far off by any evolutionist standard today. Now, they tell people they know that dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago. And then when that date changes, the new one will be a fact. 